From training to performing, join our Big League Conversation. Welcome to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast with your host, Eric Cressy. Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 87. We're back with another sports medicine themed podcast with one of the most respected orthopedic surgeons in the country. And what I think is particularly awesome about this is he's not just a surgeon, he's also an innovator. He's doing a great job of trying to push, you know, not just elbow surgeries, but biological interventions, a lot of other things to the forefront as we, we progress forward and try to improve this sports medicine world. Also has a really good perspective um, on what we do from a strength and conditioning standpoint, the importance of rehabilitation professionals with respect to you know, improving surgical outcomes. So just a really well-rounded um, you know, educator and also obviously a phenomenal surgeon. So I think he'll be a great resource and we'll learn a lot today. If you're a baseball pitcher, you know that keeping your arm healthy is essential. But with high training volumes on top of participation in games, that's not always easy. Overuse is a significant problem for players at every level of competition right now. Certainly we see elbow and shoulder injuries as some of the most common overuse injuries in baseball. At the professional level, an ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow injury can result in an average of 17.2 months out of competition. For youth players, overuse is also a predominant injury mechanism of injury. If you miss out on that much time, you're also missing out on a lot of development. So really, at the end of the day, there are three ways we can combat overuse. First, you can reduce workload. And certainly there have been a lot of research studies out there on pitch counts. Second, and the theme of this podcast, is that you can build a significant level of fitness to prepare yourself. However, a third key approach that's often overlooked is that you can work to improve your recovery so that you can safely display the fitness that you've built day in and day out. And that's really where Mark Pro is an effective tool. Some athletes will even use it to warm up their arms before they throw. Mark Pro is a cutting edge EMS device that uses patented technology to create non-fatiguing muscle activation. And this is what sets it apart from other recovery tools. Muscle activation with Mark Pro facilitates each stage of the body's natural recovery process, similar to active recovery, but without the extra effort and muscular fatigue. Athletes can use it for as long as they need to ensure a more full and quick recovery between training or games. With its portability and ease of use, players can use Mark Pro while traveling between games or while relaxing at home. We even have players that use it all the time on team flights to help them bounce back. We have plenty of pro athletes that use this, and players from every Major League Baseball team use it. Put Mark Pro to the test for yourself and take advantage of the great deal they have set up for our listeners through the end of May. Just head to markpro.com and use promo code CRESSY at checkout for 20% off your order. Again, that's markpro.com, M-A-R-C-P-R-O.com, and use the promo code CRESSY, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y, at checkout to get 20% off your order through the end of May. Today's guest is one of the most respected orthopedic surgeons in the country. He graduated from North Carolina State University with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and then continued to Duke University School of Medicine where he graduated his medical degree in 1994. He completed his orthopedic surgery residency at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City and thereafter accepted a fellowship in sports medicine at the American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham, Alabama. He eventually became a partner in the Andrew Sports Medicine and Orthopedic Center and currently serves on the board of trustees at the American Baseball Foundation and the American Sports Medicine Institute, where he conducts research and serves as the director for the ASMI Sports Medicine Fellowship Program. He serves as medical director for USA Cheer, the national governing body for cheerleading, and also associate medical director for World Wrestling Entertainment. He serves as the team physician for Troy University and numerous Alabama high schools, and also provides sports medicine assistance for both the Alabama Ballet and the Birmingham Barons, the AA affiliate of the Chicago White Sox. As you'll learn in this conversation, he's at the cutting edge of sports medicine on topics ranging from progressive elbow surgeries to biologic interventions. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Jeffrey Dugas. Welcome to the show, Dr. Dugas, and thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. So I am extremely excited about this one because I, you're obviously a, a super accomplished surgeon, brilliant clinician, but what I think is really extra exciting about having you as a guest is you're, you're really at the forefront of how we manage you know, UCL injuries, um, you know, both the research and the practice of, of not just reconstructions, but also revisions. So I, I think maybe that's a good place to get jumping off because it seems like that's where uh, you know, a lot of your focus has been over the last couple of years. 
talk to me a little bit about how you know your interest in the UCL revision came about and you know how it's progressed. Well, it really came about because it's an operation that all of us that do it don't really love. You know, I mean, the outcomes are just not that good. And in, mm-hmm. in the world of what we as sports medicine docs do, the success rates that we deal with are in the 90s. You know, we like dealing in the 90s, you know, mm-hmm. ACL surgery, rotator cuff surgery, UCL surgery, all these all these different things. And the, and the return to play rates are high and our brains, you know, we chose sports medicine because our brains like that stuff. So revision UCL reconstruction is just not a good operation in terms mm-hmm. of, of return rate and the time and the success and the, the statistics are just not that good. And that, that doesn't sit well with people like us. And so as we came out with the, the repair idea, uh, one of the things, and I think it was Neil Elitrosh who first said this to me was, you know, he said, you know, Jeffrey, you might be onto something because the, the revision, the revision operation is so not good. Maybe this is a good idea for revisions. And I, I hadn't really thought about it to that point, but we circled back on that after we got it going and, and it's turned out to be really a good thing for, for revision. So I, I can't take credit for the original thought of it, but we certainly have pushed it in the last seven or eight years as a, as a good alternative to reconstruction. Absolutely. And, you know, so I'm curious, as I recall, there was an interesting story, you know, you've done the UCL repair with internal brace and, you know, kind of been at the forefront of, of not just, you know, how to perform the surgery, but also how to qualify certain patients as good candidates for it. So where did the, um, where did the idea of the, the repair with internal brace originate? As I recall, it was a pretty cool story. Well, you know, Dr. Andrews, I, I sat next to him and stood next to him for the better part of, you know, 10 years as I started my career. And when you cut into, you know, several hundred of those ligaments every year doing reconstructions, what you find is, is there's a spectrum of injury. So everything from blown in half and it looks like a bomb went off in that ligament to are we operating on the correct elbow because this doesn't really look that bad. And, you know, you have an MRI or an ultrasound or something that shows you what the, you know, radiographic pathology is. And you try to marry that up with the clinical picture of the history and what you find on exam and what the patient tells you. And if it matches up, that's always good. But, you know, sometimes you cut into these ligaments and you think, geez, this is really not that impressive. But your our only option was reconstruction. We had we had one hammer for every nail. Mm -hmm. And so I can remember Dr. Andrews sitting there telling me, you know, I, I think it was in like 09, maybe 09 or 2010. He said, you know, come up with a better idea. (laughs) And I was like, okay. So it was something that I had thought about, you know, could we do this with less? Could we, could we modify either the modified Job or the docking technique? And, uh, and, and it was born out of that. And it turned out that that was about the same time that the internal brace was, uh, you know, coming about in the ankle, Gordon Mackay, the uh, Scottish surgeon who came up with the idea. Um, and, and I thought, man, we could apply that to the elbow. I wonder if that would work. So I, I guess what, what's the leap of faith to try it for the first time? That, that's maybe the part of the story I've never heard. So I'm, I'm well, curious to see when you first let me tell you. realized it. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, that was, uh, so I decided that I was not going to do this in a, in a living human being until I had absolutely done everything I could to make sure that it was at least as good as what we were doing every day with reconstruction. Mm-hmm. So I set out starting in about 2000. 11 2012 we we started with cadaver studies and we compared the repair with internal brace to our standard reconstruction just to make sure it was at least as good at time zero Mm -hmm. and that we weren't over constraining the elbow and we could find the isometric points and all these kind of things that turned out okay and then i did the first one in a kid who really didn't have a better option. It was either do it or he wasn't going to play. And that was, it was going to be the end of his, of his baseball career. Mm -hmm. So I had the right one. And shortly after that, I I only did three or four in the first six or eight months because I wanted to make sure they all got back. So I did two baseball players, a, a, a wrestler and a gymnast. And after I did those four and during the time that they were recovering, 
I did another, we did another study looking at cyclic loading because I wanted to know how to rehab these guys. And so Kevin Wilk, you know, our, our therapist the guy, the, I, and I, I'll say his name a bunch because he makes me look good all the time. But <laughs> so Kevin and I sat down and we had an idea with one of the biomechanists, uh, Glenn Fleissig. And we talked about how we could look at this and see if the gap opening between the two procedures was different at 100 and 500 cycles. And so we knew we could rehab these guys a little more aggressively. And, and that was the way it turned out. So it wasn't until those first four came back and did well that we did the next one. So really in the first year, we maybe did five or six procedures. Um, and we kind of designed the rehab protocol with Kevin. Interesting. Now, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, we always kind of in the back of our minds, we develop, you know, both the, you know, the very objective timelines, and then there's like the subjective components, you always, you know, right. like I've seen ulnar nerve transpositions where a lot of them have like that audible pop when like the scar tissue lets loose and they freak out, their elbow feels fine afterwards, you learn like these little, like ins and outs of dealing with these guys as they go through the surgeries. What are your findings when you when you do a, a, a UCL repair with internal brace on a you know, a 17 year old kid or something like that. It, it's obviously a, a pretty quick return to function compared to a, a classic Tommy John. Are there hiccups that, you know, surprise people on the way? Are there certain benchmarks that you expect, um, you know, as they work their way back? What's your, what's your normal timeline and expectation there? So uh, again, I got a lot of that from Kevin, you know, Kevin has been able to see a bunch of these and you've seen a bunch of them too. Yeah. So I, I think what you and Kevin would both say is, they definitely get their range of motion back quicker. It's mm -hmm. definitely a lesser operation. You're, you're doing less dissection. It's less, it's just less. So um, you're, you're drilling less into bone and, and things like that. So I, I think they get their range of motion back quicker. My metric for that is I want them to have full painless range of motion by the end of week six before they start their plyometric time which is about a four week program progressing from two handed to one handed. And then at the end of those four weeks, so at the end of week 10, they start their throwing program. The hiccups we see are if they don't get their motion back, you know, by week six, and that can be kind of a seesaw on that. The people that push it really hard in the beginning, that first week and go hard at it, trying to get it back really quick, sometimes actually end up being behind. And the ones that don't get the therapy in the first you know, week or so and wait two weeks, they end up being behind. So I think that I want them going about day three. You know, I, I just kind of keep the elbow quiet for a couple of days and let them do some hand stuff. And then I send them day three to five, start them on gentle range of motion, pushing for full sometime week five, week six. And, and then see them and start plyos. And if the plyos go well, then they start their throwing program. It's really interesting. And what's your what's your goal for actual return to play as both a position player and as a pitcher on the on you know this approach? So I think that you know the all, all comers in the overhead athlete is about I think the average in our study was six and a half months. Mm -hmm. I I look at you know if they it, really I can kind of know the answer if they if I know that they're okay after week ten. So if they're able to start their throwing program at the end of week 10, I can tell you that they'll be hitting live um, about six weeks later. So by the end of four months, about 16, 17 weeks from surgery, a hitter can hit live in a game. That's, that's powerful. That's a, that's a, a major league baseball off season. You know, you have the yeah, surgery October exactly. one and you're, you're good to go. Obviously throwing comes a little bit later, but throwing comes later. They're still yeah. in their throwing program, but they could hit in a game live and, and it hasn't really mattered what level of play that's kind of been true across the board um whether we do an ulnar nerve transposition whether it's proximal or distal whether it's partial or complete it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. that that's a statistic that's kind of held up um they can play a position and i kind of lump the positions into low risk high risk so you know first base slash left field hit the cutoff man kind of player you know, whether you're in, you know, high school, college or whatever, as long as the as long as the coach knows you're not yoking it to the plate from the wall, you can probably do that at about five months. So, you know, you can play first base because you're not going to have to throw the ball very far. And, you know, don't be the cutoff man. <laughs> you know, so if, if you can do those kind of things, you could probably be back in a game by five months. 
to play a position that's a little higher risk, you know, left side of the infield, outfield, you know, right field, something like that, um, you're going to be six months minimum. And to pitch, catch, I, I think you're looking at at least six and a half to seven months. Which is still um, pretty, pretty darn good. Still pretty darn good. Compared to, a, you know, TJs are now, you know, 14 yeah. is kind of the 14, average. So. 15, right. So half, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that there's obvious seasonality in those statistics. So, you know, some of the guys that got back and played in the game did, would have been ready to play in January had we been point. ready to play. So, you know, I, I tell people they ought to plan for between six and seven months and, and they almost always are somewhere in there. The other thing I've noticed as a as kind of a hidden benefit to this is when you're not taking your graft. I mean, Palmer's longest graft is the easiest thing in the world when you do them for a Tommy John surgery. When you get the the lower extremity graft, like you're you're kind of testing the waters a little bit for those first, you know, 12, 14 weeks. And you know, when you when you do the the internal brace, there's there's really no concerns about you know being able to condition the entire athlete. You can try right. lower extremity harder. You can do a lot of stuff that you might have to really proceed cautiously with. So you, you actually are probably dealing with a kinetic chain that's much more prepared for the end goal of rehab and you know participation. So um, absolutely agree. Hidden benefit. But so I guess at the other end of the spectrum, what are the things that make you nervous? Like one one question I had for you is obviously anytime you see a new procedure, right? We saw this when, you know, stem cells and PRP became yeah. popular. All of a sudden they were being advertised on billboards and sold off the back of black vans and things like that. But, you know, is that a concern that a surgery like this, where you're obviously meticulously you know, <coughs> qualifying who is a candidate for it and who isn't, do you worry that it gets out where, you know, the, you know, the smaller surgeon hometown, middle of nowhere, USA is, is rolling this out there without knowing who it really works for? Or what's your take on the next, next step for that? So, yeah, no doubt that that was a concern and still is to some extent. And I'll, I'll just tell you how I handled that. Um, I remember when I first started talking about it after the first couple of procedures at our, at our baseball course, actually. So uh, Andrews and I talked about it and we, we agreed we were going to put it up there with the caveat that this was brand new and we needed a lot of data. So don't, don't get too excited about this yet. Okay. So the second year we came back and we had about 10 or 15 patients that had done the year before that had gotten back and it was looking good. And we talked about it by the third year. That's when I went to the other elbow docs and I started talking to, you know, Mike Sicotti and Neil Elitrosh and Jim Bradley and John Conway. And, you know, some of these guys and started talking to them about, um, you know, Hey, this is an idea that I've got. And, you know, it, it really is, a good one. And I want to hear what you think. Buddy Savoy was another one that I went yeah. to. So I, I probably went to Chris Ahmad, another good, Chris is a great friend of mine. And Chris, I have to give a lot of credit to, because he was a great sounding board for me through this. Um, so, you know, these guys, the, the world, if, if your listeners don't know this, the world that we work in is very small. We all know each other. We all get along with each other. We all respect each other. Um, we actually enjoy each other's company. We go out to dinner when we go to meetings. I mean, we're, we're, we're a fairly collegial bunch. Mm-hmm. So I called these guys, you know, individually. And I said, what do you, what do you think about this? And they were all very encouraging and everybody had the same thought. Be careful. Let's not hold this out there as something people need to be doing until we get more information. And, and let's not be saying this is great for major league baseball players, which I was really cautious not to mm-hmm. do. In fact, Billy Bean was in town scouting the uh, the SEC tournament one time. This goes back like five or six years. So he was in town and he was scouting in Hoover when you know, the SEC tournaments there every year. And he he had to come into the office for something. And we were talking. I had never met him before in person. And I knew he was obviously, but we're talking. And and I asked him if he had heard about it. He said, Yeah. What, what do you think about doing that in a major league baseball player? I said, well, I don't think I'll be doing it on any starters for the A's anytime soon. We got a long way to go, you know, and and there's just not enough data that I would tell somebody that makes their living doing that to take that chance yet. He said, good move. And, uh, you know, he he was just feeling it out. So I, and I think that was true for a long time. Um, So I think we've been very cautious to not introduce it to people and not put it in the public eye 
as the end all beat all solution. It is not a replacement for reconstruction in any way. It's another option for certain levels of pathology. So it's, yeah. it's more like we created a second pair of shoes to fit some feet that, you know, one pair of shoes wasn't going to fit all of them. So um, it really was a, uh, it was born out of trying not to have to do a big operation for every one of them. Interesting. So, you know, we, we kind of talked about the UCL repair with internal brace, but, you know, jumping back to the revisions where we started, obviously we're, and this was something Dr. Camp talked about when we had him on the podcast, it was just, you know, injury rates where, yeah. you know, we, we seem to be doing better at the major league level, uh, particularly with respect to shoulders. Meanwhile, things are, are, are still absolutely surging in, you know, amateur baseball, college and the minor leagues, particularly with respect to elbow. And I'm, I'm curious. So we're, Nowadays, it's very commonplace. You're going to see three or four guys in the first round that have had UCL reconstruction already. Um, you know, and it, people don't bat an eyelash from a you know long term standpoint with it. It seems like so as we're we're seeing more of these younger guys have Tommy John. Um, you know, we're obviously going to see more revisions. They're going to have to be redone when they're you know 27, right. 28. What do you think the challenges are going to be that, that face you know you and the rest of the clinicians out there? Um, you know, as we start to see more of those and then, you know, also as a follow up, you know, what are the challenges they're going to face the players themselves and their coaches and parents? Like, how do we manage the, you know, the, the 21 year old who's already had a Tommy John, if he's back again, five years later for a second, what are, what are we thinking? Well, I can tell you, we're not thinking it's a good thing. And, uh, you know, the teams wisely are going to avoid those situations as best they can. Um, you know, I think it, it creates a value issue. I think the agents will have a hard time convincing a team to sign for a long term somebody that's had a revision of any kind. And, you know, Chris Camp, you know, he and I communicated a lot about about Rich Hill. And, and you know, we can talk about this because it's in the public you know, domain and Rich tells me I can talk about it. But, you know, the twins signed him to a one year deal following a revision with, with internal brace. And, and that was the most they were going to be willing to do. And, and it was a very incentive laden contract, which means that they, they weren't sure he was going to pitch. And, and so, you know, I think that you're going to see those kind of things happening. Um, when you have a revision situation in a pitcher, you're going to see the teams wisely shy away from, from longer term and lucrative contracts and make them force force the athlete to prove that they can come back and do it and, and put it on them. So I, I think it's going to be on us, the medical teams to, to, to guide these guys through it. I think you're going to continue to see very long recovery processes with revision reconstruction, because I think the biology of that operation just does not happen very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think that in, in, in the ones that I've seen, and then I think that, you know, obviously there aren't that many of them. Revision with internal brace, if, if the tissue is amenable to it, certainly seems to be a better option. So uh, I would certainly, if I was a pitcher at any level who had re-injured their Tommy John procedure, I would consider I, I would consider repair with internal brace as an option for all of them because the other operation just isn't that good. That's interesting. Do you do you think we're close to that getting more mainstream on the major league level where, you know, it, you know, obviously it's a little bit of a different discussion if we're talking about a 25 or a 26 year old compared to right. a, a 36, 37 year old. But are, are we are we at the cusp of that becoming more mainstream now that we've you know, we've seen a big leaguer come back from it? It's becoming a very commonplace discussion at, you know, ASMI every year. I think you're going to see some teams that are very comfortable with it. I think there's already a couple of teams that are comfortable with it. Um, and I think you'll see more of that as, as time goes on. I don't, and, and look, I think the teams have handled this exactly the way if I was the team and I was the GM, I would have handled it exactly the way they have. I don't think you open the door to big new, you know, unproven ideas when you're talking about that kind of money and, and they don't have to, why would they? Um, UCL reconstruction is still the gold standard and it's a great yeah. operation and it should be done when it's the best option. And it's usually the best option for a major league baseball player, but there are occasions where it's not. And, you know, I think the teams are increasingly open to the idea because I think the medical staffs 
are increasingly comfortable with it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that the the medical staffs will tell the teams, look, we we really don't have to be afraid of this. We've seen this, this is going to be okay. So I think there's, we're just at that cusp where there's enough N, there's enough numbers at, at all levels that the teams will start to get a little more comfortable with it. There'll be a few that won't, but I think more and more teams will get comfortable with it. Interesting. And so we'll, we'll shift to, to actual, you know, classic UCL construction. Um, yeah. And we did this with both Dr. Ahmad and Dr. Camp. You know, we, we've talked about the various approaches to UCL reconstruction. Obviously, there was Dr. Job's initial approach, and then we saw modified Job. We saw the docking procedure um, introduced later. You know, speak to maybe how the surgery has evolved, where your approach fits in. And, you know, do you see anything evolving in the in the conventional UCL reconstruction, you know, the ways that it's performed moving forward? For sure. Uh, you know, the, the original operation that, that Dr. Job did, you know, interestingly, he didn't do another one for five years after mm-hmm. Tommy John. He, he called the procedure an abject failure, <laughs> which is amazing. And, you know, Tommy John had an ulnar nerve palsy that he had to have a second operation and all these things. But he, he ended up he had a claw hand. I mean, he had a bad outcome for a while. And then he came back and won more games after than he won before. So but. Dr. Job didn't do another one for five years. So, um, you know, when you look at what his, his article and his, his information that John Conway, who was the team doc for the Rangers for a long time, he was the fellow at the time and published that. I think Neil was a fellow and Walt Lowe was a fellow and all these guys, Jim Bradley was a fellow. So this group of people that were at Curl and Job at the time, some of the best elbow surgeons that are still around. And then Andrews published his stuff with Azar um, who was a fellow at the time on his kind of modification. And the modification was that they didn't put the nerve under the muscle. They put mm-hmm. the nerve over the fascia. So it was a subcutaneous transposition rather than a submuscular transposition because of the way Tommy John had a problem. So both of them, both Dr. Frank Job, the original, and Dr. Jim Andrews, um, and then subsequently, Lou Yoakum, who was one of one of Job's partners, these three guys were probably the three best elbow surgeons in the country, and followed by Dave Alchek, who came up with the docking technique um, in in the mid in the early '90s, early to mid '90s. You know, these four guys had all tried UCL repair and failed miserably, like less than thirty percent success back in the day. And so these are the giants of elbow surgery, right? These are four horsemen of, yeah. of elbow surgery that are, that are storied surgeons. And I can tell you, having worked with, with Andrews and I worked with Alchek when I was a resident at HSS, uh, I would say that David Alchek is one of the finest technicians, mm-hmm. uh, surgeons I've ever worked with, uh, along with Dr. Andrews. He is a gifted surgeon. Mm-hmm. And I learned the docking technique before I ever learned the modified Job technique. Interesting. Interesting. So, I mean, maybe my perspective, having seen Alchek do his way and then see Andrews do his way, which was based on Job's way of doing it. So maybe my exposure and experience was a little different than most people, which may have given me a little bit more insight Mm -hmm. into, you know, how to progress this thing and, and move it forward. So in terms of what I see happening with reconstruction, I think biologics are going to find a home in reconstruction, but I think it's going to take a long time because there's so much that, that word biologics is so broad and so nonspecific. And and so really having good studies that are very specific to a specific intervention, like saying the docking technique with the addition of leukocyte poor PRP at the time of surgery, and then another shot six weeks later versus PRP, you know, the docking technique with leukocyte rich PRP done at the time of surgery and six weeks later and see what those do. I mean, you're going to have to have very specific time point, you know, studies with MRI follow up to look at healing and Mm -hmm. things like that for us to really progress that knowledge base. So we are at the very ground level of that. We're just at the point where we can start doing those kind of studies. So I do think that that will change and it probably will improve the outcome of reconstruction um, and, and possibly revision reconstruction um, down the road. 
Other than that, um, I think there's a couple of technological advances that may come out. I, I think we're probably going to see some better isometry measurement tools, you know, because not putting the, just like with ACL surgery, the, the death of a UCL is a bad tunnel. And so, especially if the humeral tunnel is posterior. So if you don't get the tunnels in the right places, that graft is doomed to fail. And just like an ACL is doomed to fail if you don't put the tunnels in the right spot. So I think you're going to see some technology coming out from some of these companies that make the isometric placement of these grafts a little bit more reproducible and reliable, even among the not experienced surgeon. Interesting. Where's your uh, stance on ulnar nerve transpositions? I know you spoke about it a little bit with respect to um, the the internal brace, but when you're doing, you know, your your normal UCL reconstruction technique, are you are you moving the nerve most of the time, or are you opting not to? We move it a hundred percent of the yeah. time, but I, but I think there's a good explanation for that. So mm -hmm. when we do our reconstruction, we're doing a, the Andrews version, the modified Job technique, mm -hmm. in which we elevate the flexor pronator mass off the ligament. And so in order, so we're going behind the flexor pronator mass to get to the UCL. In doing so, you're adjacent to the nerve, so you have to dissect the nerve out yep. in order to it. get there, yeah. right? Yep. So that's very different than doing a muscle splitting approach where you don't even have to encounter the nerve at yep. all. Mm -hmm. And you can do the whole procedure without encountering the nerve and not even worry about it. So I think that because of the way we expose the ligament, mm -hmm. you're going to have a few people that if you don't transpose the nerve, they're going to create enough bleeding and scar around that area that you've now dissected and exposed that they're going to get some post-op ulnar nerve problems. Yep if you don't transpose it. And so, and that's what I saw early in the UCL repair thing. I was trying not to transpose the nerve because we could do a much smaller incision, just pull the nerve back a little bit and, and not transpose it. And what I found was there was a handful of people I had to go back and transpose them because they were having nerve symptoms. So I went back to transposing all of them and I haven't had to go back and do that again. So to me, and, and, and that's the way Andrew's taught us was to transpose all of them but it's it's not so much because you want to transpose the nerve it's because you've already exposed it in order to see the ligament and our preference is to see the whole ligament absolutely from the back side rather than do it through a muscle split so it's a preference of exposure that i think creates the need for the transposition not just everybody transposes the nerve that's it. absolutely and you know so we had a good conversation we were in town a couple weeks ago and it was interesting. I feel like, you know, over the years we've seen, you know, we've seen big leaguers come back at 11 months to, you know, to pitch in the big leagues after a Tommy John. And I remember I think it was Lance Lynn, who was at like nine and a half, 10 months was back in minor league games. You know, sometimes these, these protocols, you know, guys just exceed the expectations. And over the course of time, it, the, the, you know, gradual, you know, creep of the return to action timeline has, has become 14 months. And, Right. Um, you know, we, we've definitely seen that with some of Stan Connie's research and his presentations. And when we were talking, you, you, your response to that was intrigued, really intrigued me. So I'm curious, if, what's your take on this 14 month kind of normal timeline to previous level of competition? Well, I think it's multiple fold. I think, you know, obviously seasonality plays into it. So, you know, if you get hurt, if you have an, if you have an operation at the end of at the end of a season, like say you pitch through, you know, September and you get hurt in September or you're trying to keep going and you're pitching with half and, you know, your elbow hurts, but you're making it work. Maybe you get a PRP or, you know, limp through the season and you have your surgery in October, you're not going to pitch the next season mm -hmm. and it's going to be 14 or 15 months before you pitch in a major league game again. So I do think that that, kind of seasonality plays into it. I also think that we are seeing the biology of what you do when you put a graft in someone. So when you when you put a tendon graft in bone tunnels and you ask it to become a ligament. Mm -hmm. So that process of ligamentization of the of the tendon graft has to occur in order for that procedure to be successful. That does not happen quickly. And then the biology of that just cannot go any faster um, at the present time. We can't make that happen quicker. So 
the early healing of the graft in the bone tunnel, you know, Scott Rodeo showed us that tendon will heal to the walls of a bone tunnel in somewhere around six weeks. But that's not the end of the story. That piece of tissue then has to become vascularized. It has to become a living, breathing part of the body. And it has to undergo that ligamentization process before it can withstand throwing a ball 90 plus miles an hour. And that's what takes so long. And that's why we delay the throwing program. You know, we're talking about now delaying throwing until some people are delaying it to six months. Mm -hmm. Some people are delaying it to five to six months. We used to start it at four months. Now we're kind of starting it at five to six months because we've recognized that the revision rate has gone up the faster we try to get these guys back. So to me, I think that's kind of the honey hole right now is the 14, 15 month range for the, for the heavy hitters, the bigger, harder throwers because of the biology that has to occur to, to get them back. It's interesting. I saw a study, you know, I know in ACLs, I've heard the number, you know, 18 months thrown around is when, you know, that tendon really, um, you know, takes on the properties of a ligament. But there was a study from Beicher et al. that said that young athletes who returned to sport nine months after an ACL reconstruction, excuse me, before nine months after an ACL reconstruction, have a rate of injury seven times that who delay their return. Do, do you think there's a critical timeline for that with, with throwers where, you know, we're basically going from, we're willing to take this risk versus, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's just not worth it at all? Well, I think that the Beitler article, you have to look at the graft. So mm -hmm. I, I want to respond to that specific thing. There's a difference between patellar tendon grafts and hamstring grafts. Sure. Good point. Because the patellar tendon graft is well vascularized because it, it has a different blood supply than a mm -hmm. hamstring tendon. So I think a hamstring tendon, really, you need to wait longer. Allograft, mm -hmm. same idea. Patellar tendon is a different story. You can go those, you can usually get those back in nine months with yeah. With no increased risk and easier reconditioning too, you can do a lot more early with a, a patellar more. tendon than a hammy. No yeah. doubt. And so, when you're dealing with the UCL, you're dealing with a soft tissue graft, which again is going to be on the longer side of things. Mm -hmm. If we had a bone tendon bone version for the UCL, maybe you could get them back quicker because that blood supply could get into that ligament and force that ligamentization process a little quicker. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of tendon or ligament bone to bone. Uh, type of uh, constructs that are that are uh, that short. So I, you'd almost have to get an allograft UCL from somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, maybe that's an option. Maybe we get a, maybe we actually take a UCL from somebody and use it as a graft. Donate, donate to a, a family member. <laughs> right, right. You got, you got somebody that doesn't want to throw anymore, you know? <laughs> um, all right. So, you know, kind of in the, in the similar vein of being progressive, I know uh, Andrew Sports Medicine has had a strong presence um, with respect to some of the biological interventions like PRP that, that we talked about earlier, um, both conservatively to manage elbows and also to improve surgical outcomes or, you know, as we facilitate that, that post-operative healing. Can you share a little bit about the success you've had with them? Um, you know, where are you using these the most? Um, and also like, you know, where are these going in the future? What do you think the, the next frontier really is? So we've done, we, we've done a lot with that um, it, across all different kinds of pathology, ranging from arthritis to, you know, sport and ligament injuries and things like that. Um, I think that you have to look at what the biologic is and what its potential is. So we'll start with like, say, PRP. Mm -hmm. PRP is a pretty broad word, it, you know, acronym. It, it's, it ranges from platelet rich to platelet poor to leukocyte rich to leukocyte poor and everything in between. So when you talk PRP, you really have to be a little more granular if we're going to understand it. Um, and I think there's a general understanding at this point of what different formulations of PRP are used for um, specifically things are used for intraarticular, extraarticular structures. Um, and, and so I think there's kind of an understanding among the people that do that. Um, ultrasound guidance is obviously very important when you're using these things. You want to get the needle exactly where you want it. And so having an ultrasound to do that is, is key. Um, and I think the cost is, is okay. A typical PRP injection is going to be, you know, five to $800 depending on where it's done. So it's, it's tolerable, right? It's not going to break the bank. It's, it's okay. PRP has done very well in some things and has not done very well in other things. It hasn't done very well in arthritis. It's done okay in the UCL. Lou Podesta, who was uh, uh, 
uh, Lou Yoakum's uh, um, primary care doc, Luga Podesta, published a study showing 88% success with, with PRP. Nobody's been able to recreate that. Um, and I would say in our hands, and this has kind of been similar across other people, it's, I'd say it's about 50-50. Um, and the major league baseball study, <laughs> yeah, right, even high. So the Major League Baseball study just didn't look very good for that, for UCL. So I, I think it's probably a little better proximal than distal. I think there's kind of general acceptance that a proximal injury is going to do better than a distal injury. I think you got to use the right kind of PRP, and again, with, a, with an ultrasound, and, and you got to have the right environment. So maybe in, in the best case scenario, we could do a little better than 50%. Okay. From there, you move up to BMAC. So we're taking bone marrow and we're centrifuging and we're getting a, a more stem cell rich, mm-hmm. um, you know, material. And, and we can put that in places. We can put that in joints. We can put that in tendons and ligaments and all those things. That probably has a little bit more biologic potential than PRP. So if you think of a stem cell like a general contractor building a house, um, the, the stem cell is the general contractor cell. And, you know, PRP may be, you know, some of the uh, delivery trucks and people that are, you know, scrambling around bringing, bringing tools and materials to the site. But without a general contractor to tell those people what to do, nothing gets built. So you got to have the stem cell population. Uh, so maybe the combination of those would be good. You can move on from there to, you know, allograft stuff and umbilical things. And mm-hmm. there, there is really not a lot of data to support, you know, those placenta and umbilical cord and, and embryon, uh, embryonic stuff. And there's really no data to support the use of those things. And my feeling, and this is just very much my personal way of looking at it, is I would rather use somebody's own stuff than try to get somebody else's stuff because I can't tell your own stuff what to do. I sure can't tell somebody else's stuff what to do. I'd rather have your DNA in there telling your things what to do than trying to confuse that with somebody else's DNA and and trying to get them to tell what to do. So I I like the idea of autographed rather than allographed. Um, I'd rather take it from the patient than than get it from somewhere else. I I think there's going to be a broad expansion of the knowledge base of these things over the next 10 to 20 years as those kind of studies I was describing get done and we learn more. Um, I also think the cost will continue to come down. Uh, it'll get more acceptable and, and, and accessible. Um, but I think we're probably still a good 10 years away from having solid answers to some of these things um, as, to, as to whether it helps or not. To give you a, a, a history of how we've done it, I have been willing to put PRP or BMAC into a ligament reconstruction or repair if the patient wants it. I've never talked a patient into it. In fact, I don't even bring it up. Mm -hmm. If they bring it up and they want me to do it, I'll do it, but I will explain to them that I don't have any data to suggest that it helps. I don't have any data to suggest that it hurts. I certainly don't think it hurts anything. But they got to understand that it's gambling. They're they're Mm -hmm. medical gambling. They're spending money and hoping it helps. And I don't think it's going to hurt anything, but I also don't necessarily think it's going to help anything. So I've probably done 10 or 12 with PRP and probably five or six with BMAC. And I I can't honestly say that I think there's a huge difference. Interesting. But I I wouldn't say that I have enough data to answer that either. Yeah, it's fairly on. I've always been intrigued in the context of probably even more so shoulders, um, just because the, the outcomes are, you know, obviously much poorer in shoulder surgeries than they are in elbows. Um, there's some, some interesting longitudinal study on, you know, rotator cuff repairs and more than right. actually holding in older populations, you know, which is probably even more compelling because stem cell content goes down as we age. You know, I, I'm curious if it's it's something that we could look at for, you know, the the classic, you know, 33 year old veteran big leaguer who's got everything imaginable torn in their shoulder. And, you know, most of those people just, you know, they they work with, you know, anti-inflammatories, things like that to nurse themselves along towards the end of a career. But do we have a, a role for some kind of biological intervention to, you know, it, obviously it's a, a much, much less harsh on the system. Right. No doubt. I, I think that that's a great place for those things. And I actually, one of the things, one of the places that I actually do tell people to get a stem cell, a BMAC type of thing is for revision rotator cuff surgery. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people the thing that I do to people that I would least want done to me is to have my rotator cuff fixed. Mm -hmm. And and that's, that's just a miserable 
it's 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 a miserable recovery and it's tough i mean and the success rate is good but it's a tough recovery and you got to have a good therapist and it's it's one of those operations you got to align the stars to get a really good outcome mm -hmm. so to fail that and have to do it again man that, that's that's awful so and i agree with you the biologic potential of that greater tuberosity where you fix the cuff is already used so i actually do tell people i think they should have a bmac injection at the time of revision and anecdotally i will tell you i think that that does increase the success rate of revision cuff repair um i, I don't have anything published but I, I think anecdotally based on what i've seen it, it does help i think in the in the ucl and the elbow stuff you know that could help i definitely think that in the aging thrower those kind of biologics can be helpful you see any future for them? Um, I know obviously you guys use bone marrow a lot. Um, I know there's been discussion of using adipose tissue, you know, blood, bursa, you know, you can kind of get stem stumps from just about anywhere. Um, do you think that's another frontier is figuring out just where to take it from? Yeah, I do. I think that that's, uh, there's been some good knowledge on that. You know, mesenchymal stem cells are what we're after. So mm -hmm. we're after the MSCs. Um, you, you know, adipose tissue, there's a lot to harvesting it. It's, it's not as simple as people think. There are some, there, there are a little bit more, uh, it's a surgical procedure to harvest stuff. And, you know, we get a lot of people that come in and say, hey, I want you to take my fat off, you know, when <laughs> you do my knee or you do my elbow, can you take off five pounds of fat? When, you, when they, when they now, for a while, they were walking and saying, this is, this is awesome. I can get my stem cells done and I can get my fat gone and I can do this. Yeah, but, you know, that's that's not exactly true. And, yeah. and there have been several studies that show that those perivascular cells are not actually even stem cells. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a lot that we still have to learn about the adipose version of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I even think that some of the allograft, you know, tissues will will improve. We'll get some more data on that. It's not that I'm down on allograft. I just yeah. think I'm not there yet. Interesting. Well, maybe in the in that same vein. So you've been active in the research world. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you two part questions. So the first one is, you know, the research that you've done, what do you think is your most compelling stuff? What do you think that, you know, the, the college athletic trainers and the physical therapist and pro baseball and the aspiring surgeons that are listening to this? What do you think they need to read, you know, to, to be prepared to take good care of throwers? Well, the first thing I would tell them is they need to know how not to overuse an arm. And I, I mean, I would say Absolutely. that there's not just one article, but a thousand articles on what not to do to overuse an arm. And, and, and you know, I, I see this and you see this all the time, the, the multi-sport athlete who's doing football workouts in the middle of baseball season and trying to pitch and hit and play on two teams and I mean, that was stuff we saw 15 years ago that we said was a bad idea. And it's still, it hasn't resonated down to the high school level. I think the colleges have mostly figured it out, but not all of them. Certainly the pro guys have figured that stuff out. You know, you don't see pitchers lifting Olympic style lifting in, in season, you know, that that's not happening. And, and so that hasn't filtered down yet. So I think that if I'm talking to high school and college trainers, They've got to be involved and get in the in, in with the strength guys and help figure out how not to injure these guys and gals. You know, softball's gotten worse too. The idea that you can't get hurt throwing a softball is a myth. Oh that is completely not true. So I think that that's probably the number one thing. And and then I would say, you know, clinically, you know, the the uh, the repair stuff has been very rewarding. Um, mostly because Andrews challenged me to do it, and and then it worked out you know, so far, knock on wood, the way it has. And I'm, I'm happy that we did it the way we did it, introducing it in a very slow and gradual way to the right people who knew how to use it before we kind of made it a little bit more mainstream. And I would even say today, there probably aren't, you know, a hundred guys around the country doing UCL repair with internal brace, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Every, everybody and their mother doesn't need to be doing this operation. I like it. And now uh, the second part of the question is, what would you love to see studied in the in the months and years ahead? What do you think we need to learn more about? This is, I this is we, the what keeps you awake at, at 3 a.m. Yeah. staring off into blackness well, question. <laughs> this, well, this is this is where, you know, Andrews and I, you know, he, he offered me this job because he and I think about this stuff when we're not working. It's what keeps us up at night. I think we need to drill down and get more granular uh, information about throwers 
because you know you can see obviously you can't compare a high school body to a major league body it doesn't matter how hard they throw a ball you can't compare a 16 year old body to a 30 year old body and say we should train like that guy so number one i think we really need to get to how do you train a high school pitcher safely because everything is based on what they see their idols and the people making a lot of money and getting college scholarships doing and they're trying to recreate that in a skeletally immature system. Absolutely. So I think that the thing that we could do that would most improve the injury risk to athletes would be to really granularly look at the high school thrower, the junior high school thrower. And there's such a variety of that body type because that's what adolescence is and figure out how to get the risk off of these kids. And whether you're a, six foot five, 220 pound strapping gym rat looking dude who can throw at 95 or you're a five foot six, 120 pound lefty who slings it Mm -hmm. and and can bend it. You know, how do you train those? They're both in the same locker room on the same team wearing the same uniform in high school and they're doing the same workouts. How do you, how do we undo that? And how do we get to where we're training these guys the way their bodies function the best? And really what we're talking about is performance training, which is what you do. Yeah, it's and right that's right. the answer. The answer is we have to performance train them, not just strength and condition them. And we have to make it unique to each person. We got to get to the point where we have enough metrics that we can take that high school freshman and realize where they are in their growth and development and train them properly so they don't get hurt. That's a phenomenal answer. It's a, it's a, it's a huge topic, but it's an important one. So, Oh man, um, and, it's and the pro- stuff that you do. I mean, what you have done to transform baseball performance training is nothing short of fantastic. And, and I know you've worked with a lot of people, but that needs to tra- that needs to get down to the high school level. Yeah, that's what we're, we're working on. And, you know, I think that it gets a lot easier to, um, I think we're, we're spoiled. There's a little bit of a velvet rope around the business where, you know, this 15, 16, 17 are all in our facility can speak to those 24, 25 year old big leaguers and say, oh, you did it this way. This, this can actually work. I think we, you know, as an industry, we need to, we need to popularize guys who have done it the right way. You know, the multi-sport guys that, that showed that there's, there's a lot of really late bloomers in professional baseball who weren't necessarily yeah. the best player on their teams at age 15, 16. So. so I'll tell you what I tell kids. I have this conversation a couple times a week. I should record it. So I'll have a kid come in and he's throwing, you know, 12 months out of the year and he's doing all these things. And this happened a couple times this week. And so I'll have to sit down because the fellows know what's coming. Okay, <laughs> kid, how many – and mom and dad are in there and they've already told me the whole statistical story of the kid and how great he is. Okay, how many games are there in a major league season? And everybody knows it's 162. How many in a triple A season? Silence. 140. <laughs> How many in a double A season? Silence. 120. How many in a single A season? Silence. 100. How many in a college season? Uh, 70. How many in a high school season? 40. Okay, well, why is that? Is it because there aren't enough baseball fields to play on and the weather's no good? No, <laughs> it's because they get hurt if you play more. And Major League Baseball knows that. But the high schools and the colleges know that, but the high schools don't. So, uh, you know, and I have to remind them that Jake Arrieta, while a physical specimen of a human being, does Pilates. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not a he's not a Olympic lifting fool. That's the truth. There's uh there's big leaguers coming all shapes and sizes, so it's all sure. about figuring out the the right mix for them. Um, that's right. So that's that's awesome. So probably a good place to wrap up. An important resounding message. Um, Folks can find more about you. Got a you got a Twitter account. It's at Jeff Dugas MD, and then uh, they can also learn more about you uh, at AndrewSportsMedicine.com. Any other places they should check you out? Are those those the big two? No, that's the big two. They can uh, come by the distillery if they're coming by Birmingham. That's right. That's come right. Check out Dread River at Dread River Co. That'll be a, that'll be a good one for all of the uh, the parents on the call who you know are, are looking for post game celebrations. <laughs> you got it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time. This is outstanding. And I know uh, everybody listening will get a ton of benefit from it. Hey, Eric, it's always great talking to you. I always learn something. And uh, man, I appreciate you and all you do. Thanks for taking such good care of my folks down there. 
uh, all the people I send you and, and, and I appreciate our relationship. You've been uh, just a terrific friend and I, I look forward to what you're going to get done here in, in the near future and, and go Yankees. Right on. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd be thrilled if you'd consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a review to read on iTunes. We welcome your suggestions for future guests and questions. Just email EliteBaseballPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for your continued support, and we'll see you next episode.